Happy Independence Day to all of you wherever you are attending or if you're tuning in online uh, because you're on vacation, you're enjoying time with your family or you're somewhere else. Uh, I, man, thanks for spending a little bit of your time with us. Uh, my wife and I got to take a couple weeks vacation in the middle of June and so uh, last weekend I was actually back traveling campuses and it was an awesome opportunity for me to see so many of you at some of our other locations that I don't always get to see. It's, uh, it's one of the hard parts about being here all the time. Not that you all don't matter to me, okay? I like being here, but it's so great to see so many of you that are on the receiving end. Um, and yes, I am shorter in real life, okay? I know. I keep telling you, but uh, the, the, the truth is that uh, that is reality. You experience, some of you experience that. And you're like, oh, wow, that's great. So... Um, one of the things that I was reminded of, which is interesting that I needed, I don't know that I needed to be, but it, I was reminded out of last weekend of the scope of what God is doing here. When you come to one service at one campus, you, you can have a limited view, good view, but a limited view of the impact that, is, that God is having through this place. But when you go to multiple services at multiple locations and you just see the the way God continues to use your investment, so many of you, and what he's doing here to make a difference, it's, it was awesome. It made me so thankful to be a part of this community of people with all of you. And uh, the reality is I know some of you haven't listened to a single word that I've said at this point because you're looking at my shirt and you're going, how do I get one of those, okay? It happens almost every week. It's like, where did you get those shoes? I'm like, what did I talk about? I don't know, but I want to know where you got your shoes. You know, and it's like, so the shirt is, yeah, that really hit home right there. That's, I'm so glad. <laughs> She's like, where did you get your shoes? So I'll tell you afterwards. Um, anyway, this shirt it was in collaboration with Flag City Apparel in Finley, Ohio. It's the Flag City edition of the You Matter shirt. And if you want one, you can go to cedarcreek.tv slash swag. That's S-W-A-G, like that's some cool swag you got there, Snyder. That's right, not swagger, swag. I'm really confusing you. Um, but if you go there, you can get a, co uh, we'll send you to their website. And we're just excited, Nick, if you're watching, thanks for collaborating with us. Uh, we, our, our team is calling this the Captain America edition. So um, I'm excited to be uh, representing that today. In fact, July, we got a lot of exciting things going on. We got fusion camp starting this week. So we got some, I know we got some student leaders who are going. If you are a middle school student or if you have a middle school student, um, I, I know for some of you, you're like, yes, please take them for a week. But we love having them at Camp Machendo. We literally take over the whole campground. It's like it becomes ours. And we bring our band and our stuff and lights and create one of the best weeks of the summer. I'm going to be there Tuesday night speaking. I've been doing that for over a decade. Love investing in the next generation. And then the 20th, we have Serve Day, which you've already heard about. And at the end of the month, we have our founding pastor, Lee Powell, coming back to speak with us. I know some of you are excited to see him again. That's going to be kind of like a family reunion weekend. So I'm hoping some familiar faces he gets to experience that. And some of you have never heard him speak before, so that'll be fun. But it's Sunday night, the 28th, we got invited by the Toledo Zoo to be a part of their concert series, Under the Stars, their summer concert series. And they invited us to bring Christmas to July, which is kind of cool. So our band is going to be performing at the Toledo Zoo. The admission is free. We would love to have you join us. Bring your friends, bring your family. And you know what? It's kind of a cool opportunity for you to invite your friends who never go to church to come and experience our band without inviting them to church so that when Christmas shows up, you're like, hey, how about that second Christmas concert, if you know what I mean? So it's like us helping you help us help you with your friend kind of on mission. So it'll be kind of fun. So at the end of the month, that's your, that's your July. Lots of fun opportunities for you to create some memories and for you to engage in some of the mission with us. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of that for you. Like I said, uh, last week, or not last week, in the middle of June we were on vacation. So this is a, a picture. And what do you see? Vacation shirts. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this little tradition has been now passed down to the whole family. And we were an entourage walking around with those shirts. And we tried to wear them as many days as we could. Um, yes, we would wash them, okay, because that's important for, for me and for, for all of us. Um, but my mother-in-law is here. This is my wife, Lauren. And some of you are doing the math. You're like, I thought you had four kids. Yeah, there's seven here. And so if taking kids on vacation means it's no longer vacation, it's a family trip, then what happens when you take someone else's kids with you on vacation? What's that called? 
we called it family camp. <laughs> and we ran it like a family camp. It was great. My brother and sister-in-law, literally two days before we left for vacation, they've been pursuing this uh, calling in their life for adoption. And they got a phone call two days before we left. Um, and it took the entire two weeks that we were on vacation. We had the privilege of watching their kids and playing a, a small part in the bigger story that God is doing in their life. It's their story to tell. Um, but it was a great two weeks. And part of the reason it was an incredible two weeks is because 20 years ago, God put this person in my life. And so my wife and I, we've been together for 20 years. We will have been married 18 years. Thank you. That's great. Lauren, if you're watching, that's all for you, okay, because they know the truth, all right? That's for you, for what you've had to deal with for me. Um, but, uh, about, you know, 20 years ago we met, 18 years ago we were engaged and about to be married, and it's about this time when I started looking for places to live. So I had to find a, a, a place that we could afford, which meant my primary value was I needed something that's discount. I was like part-time staff. I might have still been an intern at the time, didn't have a lot of extra resources. And so I go around looking for apartments and I found one. I found one that looked great. And usually when you find something that's discounted, it comes with another adjective, a little bit dingy, okay? It's dingy, but being that I'd been a bachelor at college for three, like three years, it's like, I didn't notice dingy. I saw that they had a pool. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Even though it looked like a pond more than it looked like a pool, okay? You walk into the apartment, you kind of look around and you look for the basics. Do the lights work? Are there doors? You know, is there a kitchen? You don't pay attention to things like carpet that's probably older than I was, you know? And so we had a, you know, discounted but dingy apartment. As time went on and we look back at where our first apartment was, we, we, I probably didn't fully appreciate how dangerous this apartment may have been as well but we were madly in love with each other and so we moved into this place uh, after we got married and at our wedding Lauren ran into a woman who impacted her life in high school and as they were talking it's like we should do dinner and Lauren's like why don't you come over to our apartment for dinner and we you know it's like yeah we, we wanted to have guests and our new place and our new life together and so they agreed and then I, you know I don't know what went through their mind when they walked into our apartment um I, they were probably like they must have got a good deal on this place um but when we sat down or before that we were like what are we going to cook them for dinner we hadn't been married that long so it's like what do we know how to cook uh frozen pizza taquitos uh, I know how to make homemade macaroni and cheese. And so I made homemade macaroni and cheese with some steamed broccoli and some just bake it bread fresh from the Kroger produce section. And so that's the dinner that we provided, you know, we had them over it. And they were great guests. They, we had great conversation. We connected with each other. I enjoyed getting to know their story and how they knew each other. They even left us with a gift. They left us with an ornament for our tree. It was an ornament of a pickle. You might think that that's strange, but... But my friend, my wife's friend, was married to Tony Paco Jr. And so obviously it made sense. I mean, it's part of his business and, you know, tradition. And I didn't know much about Tony Paco. I wasn't from the area. I knew he kind of ran a hot dog stand downtown. And I don't think I fully appreciated the significance or the weight of that meal. It wasn't until about a year later I walked into one of the, the original Tony Paco's restaurant downtown. And I'm like, man, there's a lot of signed hot dog buns around here. And then you start looking at the names and it's like, we're, we're not talking like mayors. As valuable and as important as mayors are, we're talking like presidents and some of my favorite musicians and movie stars. And, I mean, we're talking about all sorts of things. I'm like, and now all of a sudden I got this queasy feeling in my stomach. Like he came to our dingy apartment for dinner. So I sit down to have a meal and I'm like, so what's good here? They're like, the hot dogs are great. I'm like, I know that. And they're like, oh, but one of our specialties is the chili mac. I'm like mac? Like what do you mean? Oh yeah, we make our own homemade dumpling noodles for this chili mac. It's a homemade, I made homemade mac and cheese for this guy. You know, it's like, this is, I'm feeling nauseous right now, you know? And so Tony, Debbie, if you're watching, thanks. It's like 20 years later, thanks so much for being such incredible guests. Do you know what I'm inspired by even to this day? is the way that Tony and Debbie honored my wife and I in our dingy little apartment over some homemade macaroni and cheese. Today we're starting a new series. It's called Better Than You Found It. And maybe you've heard the phrase before, grandparent, a parent, 
somebody in your life, you need to leave. We're going to leave their house. We're going to leave this place better than we found it. I'm going to point out the obvious. This isn't intentional, or this is intentional. You don't just drift into better than we found it. We drift into leaving it messier than we found it. And so this principle that I'm going to talk about, though it requires some intentionality, I believe it will leave our country better than we found it. Whether you feel excited about our country or you're concerned, this principle has the capacity to change our country. In fact, I think it's broader than that. I think it leaves all of our relationships better than we found it. And if you're taking notes, it's simple. It's this. Honor leaves our relationships better than we found them. When you honor others, family members, friends, employees, employers, classmates, school, neighbors, whatever. It leaves our relationships better than we found them. And the more we engage in this, the more I think it'll leave our country better than we found it. And so here's the the tension. Something inside of me and maybe something inside of you starts to bristle at this. Because when you hear this, you're like, ah, there's something that revolts against this idea of honor, and perhaps it's because in, in Independence Day, what do we do? We celebrate the fact that we we said no to King George. You know, it's like we're going to do our own thing, and we're going to pursue our own liberty, and we're not going to let anybody tell us what to do. And so we celebrate that, which puts us in this spot. And I'm not against freedom, but and I'm not against the pursuit of liberty. I think that's one of the things that makes our country great is when we do that well. But potentially at the expense of that is this idea of honor. And what's interesting is wherever you're at with that, honor is something that we are instructed to do with each other biblically. I mean, look at this passage. It says this, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior. And they will give honor to God when he judges the world. This word properly appears like attractive, it's excellent, it's appealing, it's honorable. When you live an honorable life, it's attractive to people around you. And here's what's, here's what's interesting. Honor doesn't mean agreement. And I think that's where some of us get stuck. Why? Because you can live properly among unbelieving neighbors. You don't agree with what they believe in, but you can still honor them. Honor isn't approval. Because if you're living carefully with unbelieving neighbors, it means they're doing things that you don't necessarily approve of, but you can still honor them. Honor doesn't mean applause either. And I think that's where some of us go. It's like, we've got, we've got to applaud. It's like, we think that honor is like butt kissing. And if my three-year-old were sitting in the front row, she'd be like, dad, you said a bad word. Okay. So it's like, no, no, that's not what honor is. Honor is not just saying nice. It can be when done appropriately, but that's not what honor is. Why? Because they'll even, go back aside, they'll even accuse you of doing something wrong. And and so there's, applause isn't always attached with honor, but when you honor others, you honor God. Let me say it differently. When you live dishonorably with others, you dishonor God. Here's another passage. Look, it says, love each other with genuine affection. Take, what's this phrase? Delight in honoring each other. So honor isn't some sort of like, burden that we have to bear oh my goodness I, I gotta I gotta try to come up with some nice thing to say this is way too difficult no it's not a burden we should actually find joy we should find delight in honoring other people here's another passage it says show proper respect to everyone not to a select few to everyone love the family of believers fear God and honor the emperor honor the emperor honor our leaders What? Some people are like, well, that was written a long time ago when times were different. No, 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 time out. This emperor was killing Christians. Like, like, uh, uh, done. You know, it's like over, life over, killing Christians. And he's saying to honor that guy. Not only that, you know what this emperor, the Caesar, the Caesar of Rome was saying? That every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Caesar is Lord. It's Christians who repurpose that to say that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so here's what's interesting. Honor isn't blind obedience either. 
It's not just sitting there and keeping your mouth shut over inappropriate behavior. So, so he's saying we can honor the emperor who is acting like a God, even though we don't approve, we don't agree, and when we don't blindly just follow. So what, is, what does it mean to honor then? When you look at the Jewish scriptures, the way that honor was described thousands of years ago, it was to give weight to. It's to give weight to someone or something. The way that their economy worked was they used a scale to measure the weight of what something was worth. Scales were so important. And they wanted an honest scale to give an honest weight. And so when I was thinking about what honor ultimately is, here's the way that I put it. You can put this in your key takeaways if you would like. Honor is the weight of worth that you give someone or something. Honor is the weight of worth that you give it. To dishonor someone or something is to take it lightly. So when, when you say like, don't use God's name in vain, essentially you dishonor God's name, not just when you say, you know, GD because you stubbed your toe, or, you know, use it. It's, it's any time you use God's name lightly or you try to take away the weight of his significance in your life. That's dishonoring to God. And we can dishonor God and the people in our life anytime we try to take away the weight of what they're worth, which raises this tension question that may, maybe you're asking, well, what is a person worth? I mean, maybe the better question is, who determines what th those people are worth? And this is where we experience the tension. Because I'm not going to give honor to somebody if they don't deserve it. I'm not going to honor you if you don't earn it. I'm not going to honor you if it's not worth it. And I think, friends, that that's the problem. You see, the problem is when we think about honor, we think it's about for the person receiving it. And so I'm not going to give it to you if you don't deserve it, if you don't earn it, if you're not worth it, when in reality. Honor is ultimately about the giver more than the receiver. Honor has more to do with you than it has to do with the people around you. Don't believe me? Let's look at this passage. It says that we should honor our father and mother. Did you know that this is one of the Ten Commandments? Many of you, you've heard it before. It's probably been preached to you before by a mom, dad, grandma, or somebody in your life. You should honor your father and your mother. But what we don't always realize is that this commandment came with a second part. Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God has given you. Who benefits from this command? You do. It doesn't say then your parents will live a full and long life. Now, what's interesting is that honor doesn't mean you have to agree. You don't have to approve. It doesn't mean you applaud everything. It doesn't mean you turn a blind eye to dysfunction or abuse or any of those things. No, no. you give them the weight of their worth. And at the fundamental level, you have to acknowledge that you wouldn't be here without them. And so you begin to honor that. You give it the weight that it deserves in your life. Here's another one. Another passage says, in the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives. So if you want a good marriage, husbands, or if you hope to be married someday, learn how to honor your wives. There's another passage that says, wives, respect or honor your husbands. Look at, look at how he unpacks this though. He says, to treat her with, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Honor her by giving her the weight of her worth, Right? She may be weaker than you are. And some people stop here. They put a period here. They, they think this is the end of the sentence. And so some men who have a masculinity complex, they keep reminding their wives, you're the weaker vessel. And you're, you're, you are less than me. Some people, that's where they live. And that's not what Peter is teaching here. Other people take the victim side of this and they go, see, the Bible is chauvinistic. And it just, it perpetuates these chauvinistic ideas with phrases like that. That's not what this is teaching either. Look at the full statement. She may be weaker than you are, which would have been a common cultural perception. But what's Peter teaching? But she is your equal partner. This would have been revolutionary in that day. She's your equal partner in God's gift of new life. What's he saying? 
Honor the weight of her worth. Honor the value that God has given her. Husbands, we should do that with our wives. Wives, we should do that with our husbands. We should do that in our relationships, in our family. Why? Look at what he says next. Treat her as you should so that whose prayers? Your prayers will not be hindered. Honor is ultimately about you. And it's not just children to parents. It's not just husbands to wives. It's wives to husbands. It's not just our families. The Bible teaches us to honor our employers, honor our employees, to honor our leaders. Why is this important? Because when we honor, it shows, it reveals something that's taken place inside of us. It's illustrated in this proverb. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Some of you have heard the phrase before. We say it when we see people of significance. When their life begins to crumble, we say pride goes before the fall. That's right. Pride goes before the fall. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. That's why we we watch some of the words that we say. We're like, yep, that's right. I'm just trying to protect them. I'm just trying to keep them humble. You know what? I don't want them to get a big head. Uh, You know what? I'm just going to, some people think it's their assignment to make sure that they don't have a downfall. And so they go around pointing out all of the problems because why? Humility comes before honor. And let me just clarify something. It's not your job to keep people humble. For some of you, this means a lot of what you do most of the week can be taken off of your job description. Because you don't need to show up at work and your family and every other conversation making sure the people are humble. You know what that reveals? That reveals your own arrogance and pride. Because you think you determine the worth of the people in your life. No, no, no. Instead, it's when you honor people that you reveal something that has already taken place in your life. That's what he teaches here. He says that humility comes before honor. And so when you are able to honor others, it means you have a posture of humility in your life. But we miss it. Here's the way that I put it in my notes. My inability to honor you reveals a pride in me more than a problem in you. I'm not saying that there isn't a problem that may need to be addressed or corrected or whatever. I'm not saying it's not approval, it's not agreement, it's not applause. No, my inability to give you the weight of your worth reveals a pride issue in me more than a problem in you. Because I think I'm the one that determines what people are worth. In our life, you know, we, we have these things that are worth things. A dollar bill, hundred dollar bill. If you think about it, uh, they're the same size, printed on the same kind of fabric that feels kind of like paper, same kind of ink. They look almost the same, but if I were to say, hey, I'm going to give away this dollar, how many of you are going to run out of your seats for it? You know, it's like, it's a dollar. You know, my six-year-old might be like, do you know what I could get with that? And so he'd come running down. He's interested in a dollar. But if I said, hey, $100, who wants it? Come up and get, I'm not saying get out of your seat, okay? You can, I'm not giving away a $100 bill today. But this, why? Because we honor the weight of its worth. And do you determine the weight? No. No, you honor the weight. It's, it's cloth. It's like paper. You honor the weight of its worth. And this is what we need to do with the people around us. You see, when we think we determine the weight of the worth, then we treat people differently, inappropriately. We think we can assign value. And so we can show up and we go, you know what? I don't think it's really worth that much to me. I don't think you're doing the right things. And we just start to rip up and devalue things. Some of you are like, you just ripped up a $100 bill? I got tons of them. It's no big deal. Okay. I'm just kidding. It's a movie prop, all right? It's only printed on one side. I had to make sure I held it like this. Because $100 is worth a lot. (laughs) It's like, I'm not going to rip that up. Are you kidding me? It's it's like, uh, you know, a bunch of Starbucks coffees there. So that's what we do with God. 
When we think we're the ones that determine what people are worth or what people are worth honoring, then we take the lives that God values and it's like, oh, you got this one wrong. Jesus taught about this. Look at what he said. He says, you know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. He's talking to his disciples and the disciples are like, you know, that's true, man. Have you seen Caesar lately? Have you seen Pontius Pilate? Have you seen those leaders? Man, they, they're just lording it over everybody. They think they're amazing. They're demanding everybody honor them. They're telling people that they're worthless. This is, it's amazing how times don't really change, isn't it? We struggle with this today. This is the way we treat each other. But look at what Jesus says next. But among you, among you Jesus followers, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be a first among you must become your slave. So what does greatness look like? When you serve. How do you honor others? When you allow the weight of their worth in God's eyes to allow you to serve them. And you can serve anybody. Whether you agree with them, whether you approve, you can serve them. Why? Why does he ask us to serve them? Because he goes on to say this, for even the son of man, he's talking about himself. For even I came not to be served, though he deserved it. I came not to be honored, though he should have been honored everywhere he went. He came not to be served, but to serve others. Not only that, to give his life as a ransom, a payment, to sacrifice his life. And so how do we honor others? We serve and we give. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. And on the service, it's like, okay, I just need to serve more and I need to give more. And that's in part true, but what you miss is the deeper truth. The answer to the question is, what is someone worth? Maybe a better way to say that is, what is the weight that God says every person is worth? You know what they're worth? They're worth the son of man giving his life as a ransom for you and for them. When you allow this truth into your life, when you recognize that you need God's grace in your life, then you have a posture of humility knowing that you don't determine what someone is worth, that God and his graciousness has, and that begins to open your eyes to see how he views everyone else around you. And suddenly you realize that even though you don't in your own have the capacity to honor others because God is graciously honored or declared your life worth the life of his son, you can begin to share that honor with the world around you. And so how do we do that? I mean, one of the simple ways that we come, it's, it's like obvious, is with our words. We should use our words to honor our parents, to honor our spouse, to honor our kids. The scriptures, the Bible teaches us to honor our spiritual leaders. Some of you are like, ah, I see where you're going with this, Ben. You want more. No, this is something that I'm learning how to do. In fact, I, I would love for you to get, what does it mean? To use your words to show them the weight of their worth in your life. We should do this with our bosses, with our employees, with our neighbors, with our teachers, with our friends. We should use, our, we should take delight in this. Not making it up, but, but giving them words to declare the value that they have in your life. We should do this often. And I know some of you right now, you're like, but Ben, you don't realize what they've done. You don't realize how hard this is. I know for some of you, that one step is what makes honor difficult for you. And so, man, don't make something up, but at least begin to see the value that God put on their life. And so even if you don't have a whole lot of nice glowing things to say about them, ask God to help you get to the place where you can see them the way that he does as someone who matters to him. Another way that we can honor people though is with our priorities, not just our words. 
Whatever is worth most to you, you move up on the priority list. You move to the top of that priority list. And so the things that we honor most, we prioritize the highest. Look at the way that the Proverbs talk about this. We should honor the Lord. We should honor or prioritize him above everything else. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. Now don't confuse this for a giving talk. Because some people, when it comes to giving, they go, well, does the church deserve it? Have they earned it? What are they doing with it? That's the wrong question. Now, don't misunderstand me. I think it's helpful and beneficial to evaluate as the church being a good steward of the resources. I think that's fair. But the issue is, are you honoring God by giving a portion back to him? Of what he has given you. Because when you take that lightly. When you take it for yourself. You are dishonoring. Literally you are stealing from God. You think it's yours. You think you're the one that determines where all of that goes. This is why giving is important. Not because. It's it's because it's your way of honoring God first. And saying God I'm, I'm reminded that you are my provider. You are the one who gives to me. I am trusting you for all that I have. That's why it's so powerful. And it's not just with our finances. It's with the best part of everything that you produce. So the first part of your day, should your priority should be, God, thank you for today. At the very least, begin your day with a little space of prayer. Begin your meeting. Begin your work. Begin your meals. Begin your adventures. Celebrate your vacations by acknowledging the the weight, the significance that God has, the grace that he's poured out on our life. This is why we try to wake up every day and start our day with a living it out and a little bit of Bible reading and prayer. It's to go, okay, God, I want to remember who you are. And I think we should do that in our relationships. I think we should honor our marriages above any other relationship in our life. I tell that to my kids. You know, the most important person in our family is Lauren. It's my wife. It's your mom. And at first they're like, we're not important to you. And I'm like, no, you're all really important to me. But a healthy marriage will lead to a healthy family. And when our marriage is working well, you all are going to reap the benefits. And so I think it should be God, marriage, kids. I think we should prioritize work, not above those things, but make it a priority for us. And yes, you're going to need to take some time for you to refresh and recharge. Honor the weight of the worth of those things in your life. Don't make light of them. We can honor people with our priorities. Another way that we're doing this is on serve day. Essentially, we just want to show our community that it's a priority to us. We're not just sitting here saying that our community matters. We want to invite you to join us in showing our community that it matters. That's ultimately what this is about. Why? Because the way you prioritize others reveals what you honor most. Another way that we show honor is with our perspective. How do you view people who are not like you? How do you think and talk about people who are not like you or when they're not in the room? Because here's what's interesting. The further you are away from someone, the clearer you think you see. The further you, you are away from the leadership table or the boss or, or that organization or that political party, whatever it is, the clearer you think you see. I experienced this a couple of years ago when the Browns had the first round draft pick. You know what I was telling my friends? Because of all of the amazing quarterbacks that were available, I said, if the Browns draft Baker Mayfield, like Johnny Manziel 2.0, I'm going to quit the Browns. Because from where I st- stood with all of my football experience, it was obvious that was a dumb pick. And so here we are out on date night, my wife and I, and the draft comes on the TV and the announcer says the Browns pick with a, fr-. you know the story, they pick Baker Mayfield. My wife captured my photo in this moment, my face. That's called an oh crap moment, okay? It's like, I just told people that I'm going to quit the Browns and they just drafted, what am I going to do now? So I just kind of laid low and rolled my eyes. and Why? Because the further I am away from something, the clearer, the most obvious, I, I see it so clearly. And so that's why, you know, a couple years later, I'm the proud owner of a Baker Mayfield Cleveland Browns football jersey. It's the very first football jersey that I've ever bought for the Browns. In fact, with Odell Beckham Jr., I can see clearly that we're going to, you know, beat everybody. Go to the Super Bowl. Six years in a row. Everybody's going to be a Browns fan by the end of this. Come on, you know that's good. We're all delirious, right? You know, it's like... (laughs) 
Uh, I said that to Ben Roethlisberger a couple weeks ago when he was at Finley. He's like, well, I'm still 20 and like one against the Browns. I ain't scared. <laughs> That's, this is your year, buddy. All right. So, you know, it's like the, it's, it's one thing when it comes to sports, but sometimes the way that or the perspective that we have of our employer, we just think we see it so clearly. The perspective that we have of a political party that's maybe not ours, we just, we just think we see it so clearly. We think we understand how crazy or whatever the, you know, certain leaders are, and we love to poke holes. We think we see the press. We, see, we think we see those people. We think we see other races, other religions, other genders, other issues so clearly. And you know one of the most honorable things that you could do is take a little bit of time to authentically and genuinely try to understand it from their perspective. Oh, but Ben, I do. I, I've read. And I've, yeah. Honor the weight of their worth. See, we're, we're even told to do this with our enemies, with the people who hurt us. And I have a feeling that when you sit down and you talk to people who've made some terrible decisions in their life, if you hear their story of how they got there, Nine times out of 10, you go, oh, I don't agree and I don't approve and I'm not applauding, but I can see, I can see how, how that happened. See, this is how God honors us. God, God sees what you've done, but he focuses on what you can become with him. And friends, that's powerful. That's what it means to look at someone else's perspective. Yes, you may need to have a correction conversation. You may need to put some boundaries in place if there's some dysfunction or abuse. You may need to separate for a season. You may need to engage in all of those things. In fact, keeping something that's unhealthy or dysfunctional quiet is not honoring to anyone. But just because people are doing those things doesn't make them worthless. God sees what you've done what I've done, but he focuses on what you can become. So those of you who are watching at Toledo Correctional right now, you see what you've done. God sees what you've done, but he focuses on what you can become. And I want you to know that there's an army of people out here cheering for you. Yeah, we can see what you've done, and we need, we're going to acknowledge that, but man, we're going to focus on what you can become when you choose to journey with Jesus. Yes, it's okay to not be okay, but man, we find hope in the fact that God doesn't want it to stay that way. And that's the kind of faith community that God invites the church to be, a place of hope and restoration, a place of honor that sees people the way that God does. So don't miss that truth. Here's the last way that we can honor people is with our prayers. It's really hard to be critical of someone when you're praying for them. Now, but by pray for, I don't mean pray against. You know, it's like, I'm praying for them. I'm just praying that God would wipe them off the face of the earth, you know. <laughs> that, that's not the kind of prayer I'm talking about. I mean, authentically praying for them. In order to pray for someone, you have to, you have to pray for something that's valuable for them. In order to do that, you have to be able to acknowledge the weight of their worth, which means you have to see them the way that God does. A couple of months ago, I was invited by Representative Gambari, who attends here at the Perrysburg campus, to head to Columbus. If, if, he asked if I would be interested to offer the invocation at the beginning of session, house session. And so I said yes. And uh, man, what an, an incredible perspective shift for me. In fact, I want to show you a picture of something that you haven't seen maybe before in your life. It's me in a suit. Look at that. I actually have a suit. No, how to tie a tie. Representative Gambari over there. This is the Mr. Speaker, Speaker of the House, and uh, he pretty much runs the floor. And I was given an opportunity to give a couple minute prayer on behalf of all these people. You know what I realized after going through this is I don't pray for our leaders enough. I need to pray for them to acknowledge the weight of the worth, their worth, that they're making decisions for our benefit. Whether I agree with them, approve of all of them or not, man, every week they're sitting down feeling the weight of that. And so I was able to get a picture with some of the representatives in the areas where we have campuses. And so I'm keeping this front of mind for me, cheering for them, praying for them, praying for our mayor, praying for the people in Washington, praying for the people who serve our community. 
And you may be sitting there going, well, I don't know what to pray. It's like, God, I pray for the leaders. Yeah, that's a great start. But I want to share with you the prayer that I shared with all of them. And hopefully it'll help give you some words and phrases that may be beneficial to you. And so let's watch. I'd like to invite our guests in the gallery to please rise and join our members in today's opening prayer and to please remain standing at the conclusion of the prayer for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Representative Gambari, would you please uh, introduce our guest invocator? Well, good afternoon. It's great to be with you all today. Pastor Ben Snyder is the uh, lead pastor of Cedar Creek Church uh, there in Wood County's House District 3. He was the first intern ever at Cedar Creek Church and has been the lead pastor of Cedar Creek for the last four years. Uh, pastor Snyder also uh, officiated the uh, funeral of my late mother-in-law, and so Pastor Ben's got a really special spot in my heart. And back home at Cedar Creek, they have six campuses and also stream live into the uh, Lucas County uh, Correctional Institution. So I'd like to invite Pastor Snyder uh, to deliver today's prayer. Thank you. Thanks, Representative Gambari, and Mr. Speaker, thanks for the privilege of praying today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are our creator, our inspiration, our protector, and our leader. And I confess that all too often I move to my requests and my needs, my work, and overlook the most important thing, that you are here with us. What a privilege it is to speak with you in this moment. And so today, it's my honor to pray for these amazing men and women whose purpose it is to participate in the very first commandment you gave, to subdue the earth, to have dominion, to govern. Help them to lead our state in the way that you have led us. Though you had power of God, you did not force your power upon us, but instead sought to serve for the good of all. Protect us from anything or anyone that would threaten our civil liberties and the freedoms we all share. Protect us also from the real enemy, our own pride, that can threaten to divide, consume, and destroy in all good thing, goodness in all things. Since there is nothing new under the sun, you're never taken by surprise. Instead, you offer wisdom to anyone who asks. And so today, I ask for your perspective and clarity and courage and patience for these amazing men and women to fight for all that is right. Remind us of the amazing people, men, women, families, businesses, and students we are invited to serve. Make their well-being our priority in the work that we have. Us. And finally, I ask that you would root deep within the hearts of everyone watching and listening today how much they matter. They matter to their families and friends whom they provide for, to the lives of their constituents they represent, more to the millions who call this great state home. But most of all, God, remind each of us that we matter to you it can be so difficult to hold on to this truth that you love us beyond what we can see or understand. But I believe, God, that when we live from that love, you accomplish infinitely more than we could ever ask or imagine. And so today, bring to life these documents, these conversations, the issues that we face, and help every one of us to live every moment like it matters. Because I believe that is how you designed us to fully live with you. And so we humbly ask these things as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Imagine what would happen if we would pray those sorts of prayers for our parents, our kids, our bosses, our teams that we lead, our neighbors, our mayor, our president, anyone in government, people in our world, even the people who've wronged us it would leave our country better than we found it. It would be much better than the alternative that I see all over social media, that I hear sometimes even in my own heart against people. So my hope is that we would live honorably, that we would take delight in honoring others giving them the weight of their worth, valuing the worth that God sees in them. 
And so my prayer for you is ultimately that you know how much you matter. It's not just some phrase that we put on a billboard or t-shirts or yard signs to be clever. It's a truth that when you receive that in your life, when you realize how much you matter, it changes the way that you live. You don't let yourself stay stuck in addiction or dysfunctional behavior. Why? Because you know that you matter to people and you matter to God. And when you know what God's grace has done in your life, suddenly you begin to see everybody a little differently and go, you ma- I hope every time that you come here, you're reminded of that truth. Because I believe that's going to make our country great the way that Jesus described great. So our theme over the next few weeks is this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let's find ways to honor people, to leave our country and leave our relationships better than we found it with our words, with our priorities, with our perspective, and with our prayers. Because you know what God's grace did? God's grace left you better than he found you. You were once lost and now you're free. You were once blind, but now you see. (laughs) You were once sinner, stuck, damaged, ashamed. And now you're a son, a daughter of the most high God. In fact, some of you, that's the reason you're here today because you've never taken that step to surrender your life over to him. I wanna give you an opportunity to do that right now every head bowed and every eye closed, wherever it is that you're watching, if you've never taken that first step of faith, it begins with a prayer acknowledging that you're going to surrender your life to him and receive the gift of forgiveness that Jesus made available at the cross when he died for sin. It's going to receive the new life that he made available when he came back from the dead. So in the quietness of your heart, if you've never taken that step, I want to give you an opportunity right now to just tell God, Tell him in the quietness of your heart, God, today I surrender my life to you. Thank you for giving your life as a ransom for me. So today I want to receive the forgiveness that I need for my sin that Jesus made available on the cross. And I believe that because he came back from the dead, I can experience new life with him. God, I want to follow you from this day forward. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen.